I'm supposed to be nervous coming up to the podium because it's not like me to speak to an audience like this in an open ground. I'm not used to it. But just as I was taught a lot of myth, I believe Americans are also taught a bunch of myth as well. You see the myth every day on the, the news media. First myth, that Islam is simply a religion. Islam is not simply a religion. That is lie number one. The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad said, Al-Islam deenun wa dawla. Islam is a religion and a state. And it's impossible to separate the two. And Americans live that lie every day watching television. The other lie is that in America, we cannot critique religion. Since when we can critique Christianity? Since when we critique Judaism, but we cannot critique the religion of Islam? I can say that because I used to be a Muslim. I lived the life of a terrorist, son of an American mother, and a son of an Arab father, who she married my father in the U.S. She went for a visit to the Middle East, and she was prevented from going back to her country, the United States of America, for 35 years held against her will. Many young American girls fall in love with Muslim guys. They fall in love and they get married and they move to the Middle East and never to see their country back again. There is no Muslim country that is signatory to the Hague Convention regarding the abduction of women and children. Islam, the religion of peace, does not permit a woman to leave back to her country if her country of origin is not Muslim and she's, if she is married to a Muslim. The other myth Americans live with, that Sufi Islam is a peaceful religion. They wanted to build a mosque by ground zero, and the proponents of this mosque say, well, you know, Faisal Abdul Rauf is a peaceful Muslim. He is a Sufi Muslim. Americans don't read what these guys say in the Arabic language. In fact, my first discussion with the head of the CIA one time, I asked him the question, name me the Muslim scholar in the U.S. that you consider the most peaceful scholar. He gave me the name Hisham Qabbani, and I said, excuse me, have you read what he says in the Arabic language? In the Arabic language, Hisham Qabbani says, even though in the English he criticizes terrorism, but in the Arabic language he says, when the Mahdi shows up, the Islamic Messiah, Christianity will cease to exist. How is that peaceful? No. When Ahmadinejad spoke at the United Nations, he talked about the coming of the Mahdi, Islamic Messianism. In fact, I remember one time sitting in a restaurant, and uh, I had a pastor and a rabbi, and we sat down and he says, you know, I've been coming to this coffee shop for the last 15 years. The owners are Palestinian Muslim and they're very peaceful. I said, can you two carry on a conversation by yourselves? I'm going to have a conversation with the waiter. The waiter came and I began to talk to him in the Arabic. Of course, I greeted him in the typical Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. And he thought I was Muslim. He did not know that I was a convert to Christianity. And I told him, I says, I'm sitting with a rabbi and a pastor, a Jew and a Christian. What do you think we should do to these guys? Don't you know the Prophet of Islam said that the day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel? What do you think we should do? He says, no, we should not kill the Jew. At least not right now. We have to wait till the Mahdi appears. So then he left and the rabbi asked me, what did he say? I said, uh, bon appetit, enjoy the menu. We have gyros, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, french fries. You are not on the menu yet. <laughs> no, Sufi Islam is not such a peaceful religion. I can show you a speech on YouTube. You can watch it by Nazim Tabrisi, who was speaking to Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Germany. And he was talking about his speech in the Turkish language, talking about when the West will bow to Islam. That's the dream. 
because most Americans, when they think of terrorism, they think of the Explosive Act. Terrorism is the Explosive Act. No, my friends, terrorism is not simply the Explosive Act. Terrorism is also the Islamist Political Act. Terrorism is the process of building mosques on ground zero by ground zero and trying to replace your constitution with Islamic Sharia law. Terrorism is a political act. Let me tell you what they say in the Arabic language, because most Americans, when they watch the Islamists come on television, they watch these programs on CNN and Fox News, and they hear all these things that is said simply in the English language. But what about what they say in their own language, in the Arabic language? Faisal Abdul Raouf, the peaceful Sufi Muslim, he says in the Arabic language, people asked me right after the 9-11 attacks, excuse me, right after the 9-11 attacks, he was asked the question, to why do movements with political agendas carry Islamic religious names? Why call it the Muslim Brotherhood? Why call it the party of Allah or Hezbollah? Why call it Islamic resistance movement or Hamas? I answer them this, that the trend towards Islamic law and justice begins in religious movements like these, because secularism had failed to deliver what the Muslim wants, which is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hello? Americans, his definition of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness is movements like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Is that a peaceful Muslim? No. He says the only law that the Muslim needs exists already in the Quran and the Hadith. Because Americans need to begin to understand Islam is not simply a religion. Islam is a religion and a state, and it's impossible to separate the two. He says, for that we collectively believe that the state that was erected by the Prophet in Arabia was the ideal model for an Islamic state. The challenge, he says, the challenge today in the Islamic world is how do we accomplish this in our current era? And then he explains how to accomplish this Islamization of America. He says an Islamic state can be established in more than just a single form or mold. It can be established through a kingdom or a democracy. The important issue, he says, is to establish the general fundamentals of Islamic Sharia law that are required to govern. He goes on to say, and he talks about how to establish all these things. Americans don't see what these guys say in the Arabic, in, in the Arabic language. They simply believe everything they're fed up by the liberal media and the English. He goes on to talk about how to conspire against this country. Here's your peaceful Islam. He says people need to use peaceful means to advise the governors and government institutions. We also suggest to the governors and political institutions to consult Muslim religious institutions and Muslim personalities in the field so as to assure their decision making to reflect the spirit of Sharia Islamic law. In other words, become prominent Muslim figures and get up there in the government and begin to influence the president, begin to influence the State Department, begin to influence the lawmakers so as the law here reflect and begin to respect the Islamic Sharia law. No, Mr. Abdul Rauf, Americans will not respect Islamic Sharia law. They will respect the Constitution of America that was established by the Founding Fathers. Tell me about Islam. Tell me that I cannot critique the religion of Islam. Tell me if we cannot critique religion in this country, then everything our forefathers and everything they bled for is for nothing. 
we are allowed to critique any religion in this country, not just Christianity, not just Richard Dawkins, well, you know, uh, God, you know, God is not great. Or Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens said, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's that book? I forgot even the book. I bought it out of my mind. He's out of his mind. That's right. What's the book called? God is not great. That's right. That's Hitchens. Sorry. I don't know. I like to ask Mr. Hitchens before he dies a question. Would he write a book titled Allah is not great? He would chicken out. You know, I must have been hit with amnesia. I remember when I first got in the liberal media, confessed ex-terrorist. Can you imagine on the media and the radio? I remember the first interview in the liberal media and say, when Walid, uh, you know, uh, since you're a confessed terrorist, don't you think you belong in prison? So you know what? You're right. I am a confessed terrorist and I do belong in prison. But why is it that you only want to imprison the confessed terrorist and you want to release the real terrorist in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> then I took a plane to England. You think America is bad? Go to England. I went to the BBC. They had these three so-called scholars who wanted to kind of rebut what I was talking about. I said, listen to me. Islamic terrorism has nothing to do with land. Islamic terrorism has nothing to do with America's so-called occupation of Iraq. Americans did not occupy Iraq. Americans liberated Kuwait. Americans shot down the rapist who went to kill Muslims, who went to rape young girls in Kuwait. What happened to that? They did not occupy Iraq. That's not why they're pissed off. It's got nothing to do with the foreign policy. It's got nothing to do with Israel establishing a state either. I said, Islamic terrorism has something to do with Islamic salvation. That's what it has something to do with. In fact, what changed me was not land deals. What changed me was not concession. What changed me was not all this talk that I hear in the radio. What changed me is when I read the Bible and saw that I do not have to give my life for Allah, that God of the Bible already gave his son to die for me. Of course, typical of the liberal media, the first interviewer says, Mr. Shubarin always takes two to tango. I said, no, sir, that's another myth. It does not take two to tango. There's usually a rapist and there's a rape victim. What did the victim do to tango? If it takes always two to tango, tell me, what did the Jews do to tango in Nazi Germany, sir? Yeah. So the second person said they must have done something. I said, tell the English people what did the Jews do to tango in Nazi Germany. He realized he just shoved his own shoe in his mouth. The third person wanted to help him. So he said, Mr. Shabbat with that English accent. Mr. Shabbat, the today's problems today, you know, we're dealing with a lot of fundamentalism. That the world can do without fundamentalism. Fundamentalism in all scales is the problem. I said, no, sir, everyone's fundamentalist. There's fundamentalist liberals, there's fundamentalist socialists, there's fundamentalist communists, there's fundamentalist Christians, there's fundamentalist Muslims, there are moderate Muslims that are fundamentalist Muslims. There are all kinds of fundamentalists. That's not the problem. Muslim fundamentalists are different than Christian fundamentalists. When I came on this trip, I got to the person next to me, I knew he was not going to play soccer. I knew he was in the middle of the air, so I began to open my Bible and witness to him about Christianity. And I admit, I must have given this person a headache. But a Muslim fundamentalist takes the whole head right off. You're telling me there's no difference? The day I became a Christian, I never forget about it. 
It seems like it's a sin to become a Christian in this country these days. I spoke at the Air Force Academy, headline news the second day. They is preaching Christianity at the Air Force Academy because I simply answered a question. The question is that a terrorist, by the shedding of his blood, he enters paradise. That's the problem. And the problem is that they could learn something else, like the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, that would help the terrorist repent. What they need is repentance. Why don't we give them a different avenue in a different way? So we got criticized for expressing our religious freedom in this country. I'm sick of it. I am sick of it. I want to express my religious freedom everywhere. I have a right. I am an American Christian and I exist in this country. Oh, you're, you're one of those guys that believes in Armageddon. Yes, I do. I believe in Armageddon. But you excuse me, most evangelical Christians in this country, they want, they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. They want to get out of here before Armageddon even starts. They're not interested in Armageddon. Oh, you believe in the apocalypse. Excuse me, let me tell you who does believe in apocalypse. Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore, is a, he believes in the apocalypse. He tells you that you need to cut down on producing children. He tells you that the earth, mother earth, is going to be destroyed. Better start giving abortions. Better kill your children. He tells you you better shut down your factories because mother earth, goddess, is going to be hurt. That's apocalypse. That's not the way of this country. God says be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Europe needs more children. It comes to terrorism, my friends. I love talking to police officers. Yesterday I had a three hour discussion with police officers. Excuse me, Mr. Officer. If somebody commits a crime like rape or murder or theft, is there any excuse? No. And it doesn't matter if that officer is a Democrat or Republican. They all know crime is a crime. There is no excuse. So I asked the question. Why, India? Why? There is no excuse. We can either keep living like that, giving excuses to crime, giving excuses to the liberal media, giving excuses to politicians. President Obama goes to Egypt. He goes to Turkey, not to remind the Turks about how many Armenians were butchered, Christians were murdered. When with Turkey, Confess their genocide. You say, well, you know, the problem with the Islamic world is one word. Confession. There is no confession. Germany confessed. Germany did confess about the Holocaust of six million Jews. It is illegal today to deny the Holocaust in Germany. Today in Turkey, if you go and talk about the Armenian genocide, you'll be thrown in prison. And do you think... We have a brave president to go and remind them about the genocide. No, he goes down to Egypt. He goes down to Turkey to kiss their asses and he comes back. And then he goes to Egypt. And what does he tell the Egyptian? What does he tell the Egyptians? Uh, the Muslims in America are suffering greatly. I haven't seen any suffering Muslims in America. Well, I, I will do everything in my power to establish an uh, 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 Islamic welfare system in America. We don't need no Islamic welfare system. Uh, I will do everything in my strength to establish zakat in America. And Americans see the speech, they don't know what the word zakat means, and they just kind of ignore it. No, Americans, pay attention to what they say. Zakat is an Islamic welfare system. Zakat is part of the Sharia laws that they so much want to establish in this country. No, 20% of Americans that criticize the president, there they say, well, he could be a Muslim. You know what? I don't know what in the world he is. I cannot make up what the president is, but the reason they suspect him is because he keeps talking like one. Stop talking like a Muslim and begin to talk like an American.
crime to read the Bible. It's a crime to pray at the Pentagon. You cannot pray at the Pentagon anymore. The son of Billy Graham can't even make a prayer service at the Pentagon. Why is it that the President of the United States of America says that the Bible teaches violence, that the Bible teaches slavery? Have you read your Bible lately, he says? Well, that one man can take over the White House and can take over the Pentagon. The other man who's a Christian cannot even conduct a prayer service at the Pentagon. This is not the America that I want to live in. This is not the America I want for my children. I never forgot the last first words I got from my mother. I got her in the airport in San Francisco. 35 years in, in, in exile. 35 years trying to escape back to the United States of America. 35 years. Her kids were brain. I was part of that brainwash system. I would turn my mother in at any inkling she wants to escape back to her country. Finally, in 1993, I became Christian. I began to ask myself, what the hell did I do to my own mother? This is the religion of peace. My mother, 35 years, 1994, I rescued her, brought her back to her country. And I remember what she told me. She said, son, I lost everything in my life. I lost my youth. I lost my hair. I lost my teeth. I lost my children. You're the only thing that I was able to salvage out of all my life. I thank you. I said, no, mother, don't thank me. Thank the verses of the Bible that you shared with me when I was 16 years old. She planted that seed. She told me about the Bible. She said, you don't have to die. You don't have to become a terrorist. God already provided a son. But again, the manure of life as usual. You go through the manures of life and every one of us has manure. It's the Up to the high heaven. But thank God for God because he uses the manure of our life to make the fruit even better and sweeter. Thank God for the Judeo-Christian values in this country. Thank God for critical thinking. I began to do critical thinking. 1991, I took a trip to Israel. My uncle took me all over the streets, all over the walls. Graffiti. What did the graffiti say? The most common graffiti on the walls in the Arabic language. We knock on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews. That's Nazism. I said, what is this? He said, why are you asking too many questions? I said, there has to be a different way to go to heaven besides knocking on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews. There has to be a different way. I got criticized by my own family for asking too many questions. They asked me, why are you asking too many questions? I said, if 10 years in America, and America developed something that you don't have, critical thinking, critical thinking. Went all over your universities, began to speak at your universities. In 150 university campuses, they have Muslim student unions, part of the Islamic Brotherhood, part of the apparatus of the terrorists. Then you have the Fort Hood massacre, 13 Americans slayed, 13 Americans slayed. And then the government sends the Islamic society of North America to brainwash the American troops, to Islamize them after massacring them. This, my friends, is a shame that has to end in this country. What does Lu'ai Safi say? Lu'ai Safi, the Islamic Society of North America, in the English language, they all condemn terrorism. But yet, in the Arabic language, he writes that every Muslim community in America have to assess their condition to see the kind of jihad they need to carry out in this country. No, my friends, Faisal Abdul Rauf, Osama Bin Laden, Anwar Awlaki all have the same goal. Their goal is to make America Sharia compliant. That's what they want. Anwar Awlaki said the same crap. Faisal Abdul Rauf says, oh, I condemn terrorism. Oh, I want uh, uh, dialogue. I want, you know, faith dialogue, uh, interreligious dialogue, so on and so forth. Where is Anwar Awlaki today? He said the same things Faisal Abdul Rauf says. 
Why are there American drones looking for him? If he was such a peaceful Muslim, they all say the same things. I call it double speak. You say one thing in the English, you say another thing in the Arabic. Americans are not used to this form. Americans need to begin to wake up. I know that kind of deception. Americans are not used to taqiyya wa kitman wa muruna. How to conceal the faith. How to conceal your true intents as a Muslim while you harbor inner animosity towards the enemy. How to be flexible and stealth. That's what it's about. Jihad, jihad by the finances. Jihad then comes by the sword. Do you want to trust these organizations? Who do you want to trust? The Council of American Islamic Relations? In which the head of the Islamic, uh, the, the care of Texas, 65 years in prison for terrorism activity. And then you have another guy, Sami Al Aryan in Florida. Who supports him? Who talks good about him? Who says this was us? It wasn't right for putting him in jail. Rashad Hussein, the speechwriter of President Obama. And then he gets an office. You have opened your fortress to the enemy. The enemy has his Trojan horse in the White House. Trojan horses in the White House. Trojan horses in the military. Trojan horses in the FBI. Trojan horses everywhere. That, my friends, has to end. No, this is not Islamophobia. No, this is not Islamophobia. Oh, Islamophobia. Excuse me? Islamophobia? The problem is not Islamophobia. The, sl the problem is Christian phobia. That's the problem. I say, Christian. Ah! Why? Why are we ashamed of who we are? Are we ashamed of what this country is about? All right. Then as Americans, do the right thing coming November. Go out there and vote and change things around for a change. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.